Welcome back to Talking Branches. Uh, I'm your true host, Timmy. I'm back in business. I actually think I should be welcoming you back. Yeah. I, You've been gone for a I while. I feel welcome. Yeah. So, oh, good. So I'm glad. Um, good. I'm glad to be back. Glad yeah. to be back doing Talking Branches. This is my first midweek session, I think. Yeah, I think so. so. You're right. Hope you guys enjoyed um, my absence, your, my replacement. Your replacement. Yeah, yeah. temporary replacement. <laughs> um, but hey, we are in this, uh, wrapping up the series, or pretty close We're getting to close, it. yep. Uh, Stop Being Such a Christian, which I have loved. And uh, this week we actually had our first in-person service, um, yeah. which really uh, is not the thing. It's another thing it's another to serve thing. our yeah. uh, audience. You know, we're mm -hmm. still doing watch parties, still doing online content. There was still a watch party going on at your house. Yeah, yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah, um, and they were still there when I got home after all the church stuff. Man, from the day they were having too much fun. I think. Yeah, sounds like fun. it. Yeah, church, it was a lot church cooler at my fun. house than it wasn't here too. So yeah, that's probably true. I'm it was sure they, they appreciated that. Uh, but on the topic of being back in mm -hmm. person, I think the, the question that everybody wants to know, and it's certainly been on the forefront of my mind, is uh, would Jesus have worn a mask? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you, don't, you don't actually have to answer that question. <laughs> but, but, in all, but in all reality, uh, Christianity uh, is often seen by people from the outside as a, as a set of rules, just a lot yeah. of do, do's and do nots. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in light of that, uh, I would like, to talk a little bit about um, how the three things you talked about at the end of your message, mm -hmm. um, if we view and live in light of those uh, commandments, really, um, how is how does that actually accomplish uh, what is viewed as a set of rules? I don't sure, know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I th I think I think a lot of times we get so caught up as humans in the rules. We want to know where's the line. We want to know how close to the line can we get before we actually jump over it. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in some ways we like rules because it gives us clarity. But the way that Jesus approached so many circumstances, it wasn't cookie cutter. It wasn't, um, it wasn't the same every single time, mm -hmm. um, which makes it sometimes hard for us to know, okay, God, what do you, what do you want me to do in this, in this moment? And so the question that we've been asking the last couple of weeks um, isn't, you know, what's right right now or, or isn't how do I get around, how do I, how do I get through this circumstance the easiest way? The question we've been asking is what does love require of me based on Jesus' new command that he gave, which was to love one another as Christ loved us, that we're supposed to love in the same way. And so when we get into a situation or a circumstance where we're not sure what to do, we start to ask the question, what does love require of me? Mm -hmm. um, and Jesus, Jesus says that that's, that, 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 that Loving God and loving others sums up the entire law, mm -hmm. that the, the entirety of the law and the prophets are summed up in loving God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, and loving others as we're supposed to love ourselves. So it really is supposed to kind of simplify things yeah. a little bit. Yeah, so think of it this way. If, if you follow all of the commands, it will lead you to loving others right. the way that Christ loved us. Or we can just start there. Or we can just start with Jesus Holy Spirit, in this situation, what does loving like you require me to do? Mm -hmm. How does it require me to communicate? How does it require me to act? And then the three things that, um, you know, are kind of, uh, I guess, make that question a little more applicable is, is that love requires, this is what I, these are the three things mm -hmm. you, you mentioned. Love requires us not to do anything to hurt ourselves because we belong to God. Mm -hmm. Love requires that we do nothing to hurt others because others belong to God. And love requires that we not be mastered by anything because if we're mastered by something, it makes it impossible to love someone mm -hmm. because we love that something more. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah a lot, but... That, that is, uh, I think, really helpful. And, and um, love, love should be easier than, than we make it, though, because uh, loving yourself... It isn't just as simple as like you know giving yourself a pat on the back you know every morning when you wake up and say right. you're valuable you're good which might be part of it right but it's not it's not the entire thing it involves you know living a lifestyle um, that's that's in line with um, kind of the example that Christ laid out for us yeah. and then um, yeah treating other people in light of that uh, can be th difficult <laughs> and I think what makes it hard we complicate what loving others looks like. Because in the back of our minds, and this is, just, this is just our sinful human nature, I think, in the back of our minds, we're still doing the line dance. Mm -hmm. We're still like, 
okay, what can I get away with? Right. What's the minimum? What's requirement? the minimum requirement Sounds that like I can me do? in college? Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> me too. Um, but that's. I think that's. I think that's what makes love so difficult because oftentimes the answer to the question, "What does love require of me?" It's not hard to answer. Mm -hmm. we, we know what it requires of us, but mm -hmm. we don't want to do it. And so we, we spend time mulling over, is there another way? Yeah. Is there an easier way? Is there a less painful way? Yeah, there's this great uh, message that Andy Stanley has where he talks about uh, what it looks like to honor someone in the same way mm -hmm. kind of love somebody. And he talks about, like, imagine being uh, in a room with your, uh, your hero, the person that you, like, mm -hmm. admire the most in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and how you would treat them, like if they showed up 15 minutes later or something like that, would you be hmm. what you would be with most of the people that you're close to and be, be like, pretty, you just, right. you know, you're late, that, this is terrible. Um, but no, you'd be understanding. Yeah. You would go out of your way to give them your, the best version of yourself. Hmm. You would get, you know, the best food out. You're not giving them leftovers, you know, you're cooking for them, you're preparing for it. Right. Um, and you're really just putting them well before yourself. And right. That really is kind of how you're supposed to treat other people right. according to Jesus' law. So, yeah, yeah that's neat. No, that's um, cool. And I think on the topic of, uh, you said, not being mastered by anything. Yeah. Um, what are some checks that we can kind of put in our life uh, to, to make sure that we don't become mastered by something. Um, also, uh, if we are already mastered, how can we, I guess, realize that, come to that realization, and maybe even how can we uh, combat it? Man. There's a lot there. But. Yeah, well, I think just kind of the first part, knowing if you're mastered by something, um, I think a good indication is when we put something above someone. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, that's even, that's also kind of hard too, because there's, there's seasons where, you know, right now for me and my family, I'm very busy. I just have a lot going on and I've talked with my family about it and said, this is kind of the goal. Mm -hmm. um, but I still have to watch and make sure I'm not putting work or a job or, um, or a project ahead of my kids or ahead of my wife all mm -hmm. the time. When we start putting things in front of people um, on our priority list, we need to ask ourselves, am I being mastered by that thing? Um, if you can't live without something, when something's that's some that's normally in the fridge isn't in the fridge, and you're right. upset about it, <laughs> that you may be mastered by that thing, that mm -hmm. object. Um, and I think the best way, really, y you can go about getting rid of that mastering many different ways. But I think the best way to go about that is to put the right master in its place, mm -hmm. which is God, which is. Jesus, which is our worship, that our lives would be full of worship of our Creator, um, and so it goes it goes right back to the basics. You know, are you, are you reading? Uh, are you engaging with God through reading your Bible? Um, are you praying on a regular basis? Um, are you uh, connecting with other people who love God and who love you? Are you do you have relationships with other people that are healthy? Um, I think the best way to get rid of being mastered by the wrong thing, again, is to, to put the correct master in its mm, place. That's good. Um, because when you put him first, he, he really begins to reprioritize your life, and he does it in a healthy way. He does it, the Holy Spirit will do it from the inside. It mm. be, he starts the work in our hearts, which is lasting, um, eternal transformation, mm. not just a behavior modification. Right. That's good. That's good, and I think there's some some other practical ways in there as well that you mentioned um, when you said you had the the kind of tendency right now with your life being busy. Yeah. You, you said that you brought your family into it and yeah. said, "Hey, yeah. this is going on. Let's yeah. just be open and upfront about yeah. it." And I think maybe the way that maybe a, a, a kind of a trigger or ping when uh, yeah. when we are coming up against something that may master us is. Are you keeping that from your spouse or keeping right. that from the people That's in your life really good. and you're not willing to be accountable with the people in your life? That That's may be really good. A, a, you know, a future thing that may be mastering you now or has the potential to. And again, it, you're reminding me too of the, the second step of that is not just, you know, inviting. It's not, it wasn't just letting my family know. It was looking at Brandy and saying, if this is off, right. I give you permission to tell me sure. it's off. Like giving people permission to, to speak into that is, is real scary, but it's really needed. Right.
Um, and, and you talked about a few other examples of, of th a few examples on Sunday of things that you can be mastered by. And there's some mm -hmm. obvious ones that come into yeah. our mind. And the one we don't like to talk about it the most, it's not sex, but it's probably money, it's right? Money, because yeah. we don't like to we don't like to talk about that. And it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't take a wealthy person to be greedy. Um, no, greed it is does something not. that that seeps into anybody at any moment. And uh, I, I really like kind of what I've landed on. Um, and again, a lot of stuff that Andy Stanley said is like, hey, to, to fight greed, to fight being mastered by greed is just to be okay giving things away, giving yeah. money away. If, it, if it's hard to let go of, mm -hmm. um, then there's an issue. And yeah. so I really like That's just, good. you know, keeping that mindset. If it, if it hurts too much to give, then, you know, yeah, what do you, yourself. What do you have in your life that, what do you have a tight fist grip mm -hmm. around? And it may, that may be something you need to go to people who love you and to God in prayer and say, hey, I can't quite let go of this thing. Is that a hard issue? What do I need to do right. to, to at least have open hands with mm -hmm. whatever that is? That's yeah. good. And I always get caught up in the, um, the, the student perspective of it when they see it in their parents, uh, you hmm. know, the, the, the car that they can never touch or grandparents or even like yeah. the car that they can never touch when, um, you know, the stuff that, the room that they're not allowed to go in because, yeah. you know, the stuff is too nice or the things they're not allowed to play with, the toys that they're not allowed to play with, ironically, you know, <laughs> stuff right. like that. And it's like right. that, that uh, shows to, that conveys to the, to the kids, to the students that, you know, that this is more valuable than, than you. you. <laughs> Which oh is my gosh. I made a okay. <laughs> quick story there. I, I made, uh, you, you remember at my old house, I had that table yep. in the corner that I made. Um, up at Jim Mask's house, a friend of mine. Um, and I poured hours into that thing, got it all set. It took me months to, to make, got it set up. Kids are all at the table. I just had, the, we just had the boys at that time and we had matchbox cars and we're, we're rolling them across the table and it was fun. Everyone was laughing until my oldest caught it like this, boom, right on the table. And it was soft pine. And I was like, don't do that. And I remember it happened a couple more times and Brandy looked at me and was like, really? You think you're going to preserve this thing? And it was, it was one of those moments where the Holy Spirit was speaking through my wife saying, hey, the table's not more important than your kids. Yeah, a couple of things. You shouldn't have used soft pine. I agree. To, yeah. I agree. And then also, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, also nothing is sacred when you have children. You don't get nothing. nice things until all your kids are 18. <laughs> That's what I think. It's all disposable and <laughs> has a... As a shelf life for yeah, sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. So shifting gears here. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a hot commodity um, that I think we've talked about in the past already. But from a social media standpoint, because that's <laughs> fun these days. Uh, from a social media standpoint, what are some examples of what love requires of a disciple, a follower of Jesus, who's actually actively following um, or trying to do this? What, what might their social media presence look like? <laughs> That is hot topic and trouble. probably a, a loaded question. But um, I mean, I think of I think of when James talks about the fact that I think it was James. Pow the power of life and death is in the tongue. Mm -hmm. Your words matter. Uh, James definitely says uh, it talks about uh, the tongue can be a spark that lights a forest fire, mm -hmm. a forest on fire, and can just totally cause destruction. Um, and I think on, so I say that, I bring that up because on social media, it's so much easier for us to lip off, uh, to be disrespectful, to be way more bold with our words than we ever would be in person. Mm -hmm. Um, but the pain that those words cause is the same, if not greater, because it's on a public stage. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an audience. There's an audience yeah. and people are watching and it's global. It's instant. It's permanent. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't go away. Y you can't take it back. Um, someone snap screenshots it and it's forever out right. there. I don't care if you delete your comment. It's still permanently out there. Um, so if what you're saying is hurtful um, and not helpful, I talked about this week, love includes um, con confronting and love includes confessing, but there's a way to confront and a way to confess that's actually loving and a way to confront that's actually really hurtful. Mm -hmm. Publicly is probably not the best way. In fact, Jesus told us how to confront and go to them. If that doesn't work, take one other and go with them. If that doesn't work, take the whole church. Um, so practicing that I think is important. And so if what you're saying on social media is hurtful, 
recognize that and change your tactic, change your strategy. Even if you're right. Even if you're right. Yeah. There's, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think social media is the wrong place to debate anything. Yeah. I think text messaging, the wrong place to debate anything. I bowed out of a text message, uh, group message this week. I was like, I will talk to you in person yeah. because I don't, do this. it's not going to work. Yeah. So yeah. those are my thoughts that are not hard and fast and they're not. Um, I just think, I think that we should approach conversation on social media with more consideration mm. and care than we even do in person right. because the context is lost completely. Right. And the tone, definitely, that one emoji or that one X, I've, I learned recently all my exclamation points that I put in text sometimes sound like I'm mad. Or you're yelling, yeah. I'm trying to be excited. Yeah. But. That's difficult. Yeah, yeah. I think knowing that just because they're on the other side of a screen somewhere else doesn't mean that God doesn't care about them or that you're exempt from loving. <laughs> they're still a human right, on the other absolutely. side of the keyboard. Yeah, that's tough. I, I actually, I deleted my Facebook app, um, so I don't visit Facebook as much uh, yeah. over the last few months, and that's been that's been really helpful. It's probably been great. And I, I just don't engage, and I allow my wife to tell me when I should stop, <laughs> and she tells me to stop all the time. She's like, what are you doing? Get off Facebook. I'm like, all right, all right. That's been helpful. Yeah. Um, so real quick, uh, we're running out of time here, but how can we love someone we don't like? Oh, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Million dollar question. Yeah. I, I think it, it really goes back to, and we've kind of talked about this topic more than, more than once over the course of the last 23 weeks um, during COVID, but it has to begin with recognizing that the person you don't like is God's creation mm -hmm. and that God made them who they are on purpose and that there's brokenness out there called sin that causes people to do and say things that are hurtful. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as Christians, as disciples, as Jesus followers, we're called to be the light of the world, not the darkness. We're called to speak hope and a future to those out there. Um, we're called to represent the love of Jesus for those we like and don't like. Um, and so that requires us to be loving, to be kind, to be truthful, but to be full of grace. Mm -hmm. um, so to love someone we don't like, first we have to recognize and remember they are a child of God just like mm -hmm. we are. And that they need the same amount of grace and mercy that we do. Right. And that there's people out there who don't like us and they still are kind to us for right. whatever reason. I really um, like what uh, Paul says about that too um, when he talks about Jesus' love for us in that same light where he says God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's one of the first verses I learned as a kid. And wow. as, as I uh, grew older, it started making more and more sense. It's like, no, while we were still offending yes. Christ, while we were still like... Yeah doing things that he didn't like, yeah. which is similar to when, you know, someone else is doing something that we don't like because, and we don't necessarily like that person, to show them grace, to show them love. And we weren't just doing things that he didn't like. We we're doing things that hurt him. Right. That caused him pain. That mm -hmm. caused his kids pain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. That's so, and that's where that, that's where, what does love require of me? It requires that I don't hurt, do anything to hurt anybody else because they are gods mm -hmm. as well yeah so that's good yeah cool well hey we're gonna wrap it up here yeah. today join us uh sunday for one of our in-person or online services and we will see you guys next week mm -hmm.